Good morning to this uh, annual press conference on banking supervision. Uh, we're providing today a simultaneous interpretation into German, French, and Italian, and the press conference is webcast live. Our speakers are Supervisory Board Chair Daniel Nui and Vice Chair Sabine Lautenschläger. They will make introductory statements, and then we will go to your questions. Daniel, please. Thank you, Connie. Yes, the microphone oh, is open. You. No, it's not? Okay, is it better like that? No, yeah, the microphone doesn't work. So we, ah, yes. now I hear something different. Okay, so good morning, ladies and gentlemen. What does 2018 have in store for banks and their supervisors? That is a very interesting question, but one that is hard to answer unless you have a crystal board, ball. Two things seem certain thought. One, banks uh, still face a number of challenges, and two, 2018 offers the ideal opportunity to tackle them. There are four reasons for this. First, the euro area economy is doing well after almost five years of growth, and this growth is broad-based across both countries and sectors. Second, technology is evolving, with digitalization being the key word here. It offers banks the opportunity to raise revenues and reduce costs. Third, Basel III has been finalized, so the world has become more stable for banks in terms of regulation too. Let me stress so that Basel III still needs to be implemented. On 4th, 2018 will be the fourth year of European banking supervision. The construction phase is clearly over. The supervisory framework is now stable and predictable and this should make life a bit easier for banks. So the conditions are good, and banks have made great strides and have become more resilient. The CET1 capital ratio of significant banks has increased by over 270 basis points since the beginning of 2015, at 14.3% by uh, Q3 2017. We can also see that profitability is rising, also uh, from a low level. So things are improving, but more needs to be done. There are two things that I would put at the top of the to-do list for a number of banks. Increase profitability and clean up balance sheets. These two things are connected, of course. Let me start with the broader issue. When it comes to profitability, European banks have been slow to adjust to the impact of the crisis. Look at banks at, in the United States. Compared with European banks, their profits fell more sharply during the crisis, but they have recovered faster. The return on equity of banks in the euro area has generally improved. For some banks, however, it remains very low, and this raises concerns about their ability to cover their cost of equity in the medium to longer run. The lack of profitability is indeed something to worry about, as only banks that make enough profits uh, will be able to support economic growth and to continue building up capital buffers. But the benign economic conditions and the desire to quickly raise profits should not lead the banks to embark on a search for yield either. It is clear that banks must find ways to become more profitable without taking excessive risk. And of course, when it comes to solutions, one size does not fit all. Each bank has its own history and needs its own strategy, but it does need a strategy. When we look closely at successful and less successful banks, there is one thing that stands out. That thing could be termed strategic steering. In a nutshell, strategic steering refers to the management ability to set a course towards the bank's long-term objectives. It comprises things like efficient processes and good governance. Those banks that master it are on average more profitable. Banks uh, have to navigate through difficult territory. They need to have a firm grip on the steering wheel. They need sound strategic processes and they need strong governance, including on risk management. And here we see a number of issues in the banks we analyzed. Overall, one of the biggest weaknesses we have seen so far relates to the way in which banks put price on loans, their loan pricing framework. 
In very general terms, this framework needs to be comprehensive. It has to cover all business lines. It has to cover all relevant costs and risk, including operational costs, and it has to be group-wide. In short, banks need to put themselves in a position to enhance their profitability, but whatever banks do to this end, they must strike a balance between risk and return. We therefore expect banks to invest in strong risk management. Bank needs to cut costs, but risk management is definitely not the place to do so. And to restore their profitability, certain banks must do more, and in particular, they must clean up their balance sheets. In the third quarter of 2017, non-performing loans, NPL, stood at 760 billion. True, they have decreased over the past few years by over 200 billion, but clearly, they remain a major problem. NPLs drag down profits, they divert resources that could be put more, uh, more productive use, and they keep banks from financing the real economy. They also create uncertainty, which indirectly might also affect stronger banks. Banks should use good times to reduce NPLs, and the good times are now. Carrying over the residual problems of the crisis to the next downturn is not a viable option. When a downturn sets in, it will become much harder to banks to get rid of NPLs. So for us, NPLs are a major issue. That's why last year we published guidance for banks on how to reduce their NPLs. Moreover, cleaning up balance sheet after a crisis is one thing. Keeping them clean ahead of the future downturns is another. That's why we are working on an addendum to our guidance that will specify how and when we expect banks to provision for new NPLs. The draft addendum was subject to a public consultation, as you know, which triggered almost 500 comments coming from 36 counterparties. Most of the comments related to the scope of the addendum on its calibration. We have reviewed all the comments very thoroughly. On that basis, we are now finalizing the addendum. Among other things, we will shift the date from which the guidance applies to a new NPLs by a few months. We will also make it even clearer that we will follow a case-by-case -case approach as part of our Pillar 2 framework, and we will publish the final addendum uh, by mid-March about. So banks should get ready for it. Banks should also get ready for, ready for the upcoming stress test by the European Banking Authority. It will be another moment of truth for banks, as it sh will show how resilient their balance sheets really are. Moreover, as the result of the EBA stress test will be published, markets, or not just supervisors, will expect banks with capital weaknesses to address them, even if it's not a pass-fail exercise. Robust, sound balance sheets are crucial for reducing risk and restoring trust in banks. By doing so, it will become easier to decide on the final pillar of the banking union, the European Deposit Insurance Scheme, EDIS. Over the past few years, banks have made some progress in reducing risk. In my view, we could therefore take EDIS a step further. So I welcome the latest proposal by the European Commission, which goes in that direction. What's more, EDIS might be accompanied by another asset quality review, and that will give banks another incentive to further reduce risk. With the single rule book, European Banking Supervision on the European Resolution Mechanism, the banking union is now well advanced. This paves the way towards a truly European banking system. That is our vision for the future. Sooner rather than later, banks should start to reach more across borders and reap the benefits of a large and largely integrated European market. Coming back to 2018, my message is this, conditions are as good as they are going to get. Banks should seize this moment and tackle the challenges they face. I now hand over to Sabine. Many thanks, Daniel. Well, ladies and gentlemen, 2018 will be the fourth year of European uh, banking supervision. And as Daniel said, the construction phase is over. We are in a steady state. In any case, our objective um, will be the same. Our task is to contribute uh, to the safety and soundness um, of banks. But uh, the safety and soundness of banks do not only depend 
um, on good supervision. It depends on sound regulation too. And as I have pointed out uh, several times already, in a world where significant banks are highly interconnected, where markets are highly interconnected, um, it is of utmost importance that sound regulation um, is done globally in scope. And in this regard, 2017 ended on a positive note. Basel III was finalized. Um, and this is good news for banks because it um, has restored regulatory certainty. And it's good news for the economy because it contributes to a stable banking sector that can finance growth. And it's good news for supervisors uh, too because it underpins our work with strong rules. As a global standard, Basel III will be applied to a diverse set um, of banks with very different bo uh, business models in very different legal and macroeconomic environments. And against this background, Basel III is a good compromise. It takes into account the differences in banks' business models, and it seeks to strike a balance between um, sometimes very contradictory interest risk sensitivity, simplicity. Yeah. So on the one hand, uh, banks will be able to take into account bank-specific risk experience they can use for the calculation of capital requirements, internal models. And on the other hand, Basel III establishes some safeguards, such as input and output floors, which will prevent capital requirements to fall below a certain capital level. Hence, with Basel III, we are not doing away with risk sensitivity, and in my view, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I am still convinced that risk-based capital requirements are efficient. They set the right incentives for banks' business strategies, and they prompt banks to carefully define, measure, and manage uh, their risks. Let us not forget that um, the financial crisis of 2007, 2008 was based on Basel I uh, capital requirements and not on Basel II. Sometimes it, this is forgotten. The next step is now to ensure that Basel III is fully and timely implemented as only with a full implementation it can contribute to financial stability. So full implementation in all relevant jurisdiction is our message. So a sound risk-based capital framework is an essential part of a stable banking system. But the internal models used by banks to calculate risk must yield adequate risk rates in the first place. And here the ECB plays an important role. As you all know, we have launched a major project um, um, it's called the Targeted Review of Internal Models, or in brief, TRIM. Uh, and TRIM has three objectives. First, to make sure that internal models used by banks comply with the regulatory standard. Second, to ensure a level playing field regarding the treatment of internal models with regard to the supervisory treatment. Yeah? <laughs> and third, to make sure that the results of internal models are driven by actual risk and not just by modeling choices. And as you can imagine, TRIM is a huge effort. We are making progress, I can tell you. So far, half of the roughly 200 on-site missions have been successfully launched. Um, the first phase started in 2017, will last until mid of this year. Um, the aim was to review the internal models that banks use for credit risk, uh, with specific for retails and SME customers, and uh, we will look until mid of year into uh, the models used for market risk and counterparty risk. The on-site missions conducted so far have been very useful in identifying best practices, good practices, and in spotting shortcomings. Uh, the deficiencies we have found are always very bank specific, but some banks have shown some common patterns. For instance, for internal models used to assess credit risk, we have found 
uh, some shortcomings with regard to data quality, with regard to the calculation of realized losses, uh, with regard to the treatment of defaulted exposure. But we have also observed that many banks have already invested heavily in relevantly strengthening um, their internal models, the governance of the internal models, and their validation. Especially the last point is a very important topic. At the same time, we are working on an update of um, our guide uh, to internal models. It um, is based on the comments received um, um, on the first version of the guide, and it is based on insights we gain from the on-site mission of TRIM. We intend to seek <coughs> feedback from the banks again. Um, the first chapter will be published for consultation in the coming month. And this part of the guide will clarify general topics such as the governance framework for and the validation of internal models. Ladies and gentlemen, so far we haven't touched uh, upon one of the biggest issues in and for Europe, this is an issue that goes far beyond uh, banks, um, but affects them as well. I'm, I'm talking about Brexit. Banks must be ready for Brexit. It will happen. Also, the EU and United Kingdom have agreed to discuss a possible transition period. We cannot be sure whether the transition period will happen. Thus, our expectation have not changed. Banks must continue to prepare for any outcome including a hard Brexit. Any bank that wishes to relocate from the UK to the Euro area should have submitted its license application already, but if it has not, it should do so by the end of the second quarter of 2018 at the latest. So far, eight banks have taken formal steps to seek a new license, and for others, are planning to significantly extend their activities in the euro area. But I can tell you we are in, um, yeah, how can I say this, in many, many meetings with um, yeah, more than 50 banks right now, and many of them are in a pre-application phase. We will continue to closely observe the Brexit negotiations, depending on how the discussion on a transition period go, we may discuss with banks whether they might be granted more time to implement their relocation plans. But we will only do so with banks that have already presented high quality and credible, credible plans for the steady state situation. And such a discussion will, of course, only cover those aspects that are within the competence yeah, of the supervisory authority. Euro area banks should also get ready for Brexit. They too should submit their license applications in accordance with the requirement of the British supervisor, the Prudential Regulation Authority. We welcome the fact um, that the PRA has provided more clarity on its supervisory approach. This will help banks for the post-Brexit world. When preparing for Brexit, banks should be in mind something we keep repeating. We won't tolerate any empty shells. Banks must be real banks if they want to operate in the euro area. European banking supervision will keep a close eye on how incoming banks will organize their business in the euro area, how complex their structures will be, in particular when assessing their resolvability. What counts for us as supervisor is that banks retain full control of the balance sheet risk within the euro area. Bank needs to establish sufficient local capability in areas such as pricing, trading, hedging, and risk management. Only then can they be deemed able to conduct their European business activities adequately. This includes direct access to financial market infrastructures. Here, they must have business continuity arrangements in place to ensure access to financial market infrastructures for all relevant exposure classes. The bottom line is that banks must remain in control 
of their own risk. We therefore expect incoming banks to be able to produce complete and accurate data on booking models, hedging strategies, and intragroup exporters. But Euro area banks should also review and disclose any changes to their booking models during the ongoing supervisory process. Ladies and gentlemen, Brexit is just one of the many challenges uh, banks are facing right now, challenges that they need to address while times are good. Um, <laughs> here I agree and join <coughs> Danielle fully. Many thanks for the attention. So we come to your questions now. Um, any questions? We should start. Okay, let's start in the first row here, please. Um, yes, hello, Nicholas Comfort from, from Bloomberg. You, um, you both mentioned uh, the, the fact that, that the ECB banking supervision is in its, in its fourth year of, ac of active supervision, but it's also Danielle Louise last year, uh, and so I'd like to ask two questions, one looking back and one looking forwards. Um, looking back over the last four years, you and your team have turned a startup into one of the world's biggest banking supervisors, pushed banks to hold more and, more importantly, better quality capital, but how would you respond to the critics who say that national interests are still rife at the SSM, and especially when it comes to big decisions like Montepaschi, and that these national interests have actually delayed and, and weakened your plans to tackle NPLs? Looking forward, how confident are you that you're setting the right priorities now for the future? I'm thinking I mean, disrupt, disruption of bank business models and, 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 and cybercrime, and, and also, what advice would you give to your successor? Thank you. Well, thank you for reminding me, <laughs> indeed, that uh, my mandate will uh, end up by the, the end of the year. Uh, we have such a momentum on supervisory issues that uh, sometimes uh, is it as if we last uh, forever or for a long time. Uh, well, uh, I don't agree with the fact that uh, we are uh, burdened or uh, preventing from acting due uh, to, to, to national interest or national bias. I think the supervisory board has been a very disciplined supervisory board, really trying to deliver on the, the European uh, mission, on the uh, European uh, ideals. Obviously, when a national bank uh, is uh, hit by uh, circumstances or by a measure uh, or is in a difficult situation, the, uh, our national colleagues uh, explain what are the, the challenges of the situations and what uh, might be the, the, the limits to what uh, can be done if we want to, to be successful. But this is very, very welcome. In fact, we have the best of two worlds. We have the expertise and experience of national supervisors, and we have the distance in the decision making, uh, which is uh, helping us, both elements, to take the, the, the good decisions. Well, if I were to give advice to my uh, successors, because uh, Sabine also is not so <laughs> staying for much longer than myself, uh, would be certainly commitment to implement the, the best supervisory practices wherever they come from within Europe uh, and belong, to strongly adhere to uh, the European mandate and European uh, ideals, to uh, be ready to fully and totally cooperate with other European uh, institutions that also have uh, a mandate to deliver which goes in the same direction as, as we are uh, going. Uh, certainly to have enough vigor to handle uh, banks on criticisms that go with the job. That's the, the, the way it works. And what else? Well, persistence uh, to make sure that uh, what has been decided is, uh, is fully implemented. But uh, I think the list is already probably too long. <laughs> Well, we are uh, tackling uh, NPLs is a journey, a journey that started in 2014 with the AQR of the, the comprehensive assessment. Then in 2015, there was the uh, guidance, uh, qualitative guidance on how to, to address them. Then we moved to uh, what should we do to avoid the piling up uh, of future NPLs that would uh, uh, turn into the legacy of the next uh, crisis, and that's the addendum. So addendum is close to finalization. Uh, 
uh, we will uh, get it uh, get it out. And for the, the stock, we have not uh, stayed uh, without action because uh, at the same moment where the, the qualitative guidance was published, uh, the supervisory dialogue started with the, the banks that were overburdened. We took the av above the average of the uh, banking union as a starting point uh, to make sure that uh, they designed their own uh, plan to go out of their legacy issues. Those plans have been challenged by the joint supervisory teams, and now they are going uh, implemented. Uh, so uh, let's see what will be uh, possible. But I think a lot will be possible on more than what we expected when we designed, uh, on the banks designed their own plans, because precisely growth is there. The, we have benign economic conditions. So okay, let's continue in the second row there. Francesco Canepa, Reuters. So my first question is, is a, is a follow-up on NPLs. So you said um, that um, individual plans individ uh, for NPL reduction are being examined. Some banks uh, have been said, most recently in Teza San Paolo yesterday, said that this is resulting effectively in the ECB putting pressure on them to offload NPLs as opposed to work them out internally. So can you just give us an update on how uh, your assessment of individual plans is going, whether you're happy or unhappy with them, and, and, and so on? And the second question is about uh, Banco Popular Español. Uh, last year, in this same press conference, you, you praised Banco Popular for, its, uh, uh, for being brave and, and coming out to markets and, say, and, 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 and saying that they, they need more capital. That, didn't quite work as perhaps people were hoping, and so what lessons can be can be learned from from Banco Popular? Well, regarding the the plans first uh, of the banks, the plans have been uh, sent uh, about a year ago to the the GSTs. Uh, they have been challenged. Sometimes the banks have produced a second plan which was more precise, either more ambitious or more credible, or both. Uh, so this is work in progress, uh, and indeed, the, the number of banks are uh, uh, changing their policy, uh, using the good times to do uh, what they can do, uh, more than they had planned to do at the beginning, and this is what, uh, in my view, uh, good supervision is about, uh, make the bank safer and stronger when uh, this can happen. Uh, regarding the... the the praise for Banco Popular or, or uh, others uh, for go getting uh, more capital. Uh, in fact, there is uh, a principle. Capital is always music to the ears of supervisors, obviously. More good quality capital for weak banks, obviously, are a positive uh, point. But uh, there is also a risk, which is to do uh, too little, too late. Uh, and if this is considered by investors uh, too little, too late, uh, it's not uh, necessarily helping the, 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 the bank through uh, the, the future. So the, the advice, again, is to for the banks to do what they have to do uh, at the right moment. This being said, uh, if you uh, read the information which is available regarding Banco Popular, uh, there are a number of uh, public elements like a change uh, in the rating, like a need to correct uh, the accounts of the end of the year that were not fully correct, and so on and so forth, all those elements. It's not about just uh, not uh, asking the, for more capital, uh, uh, at a different moment, uh, it's uh, accumulation of a number of elements that were not uh, good ones. I think the second part of the question is about Banco Popular, right? Zavino, do you want to answer that? The lessons learned, or well, the lessons learned on well, I mean, uh, lessons learned are always very bank specific, and um, I, I beg your understanding that we cannot talk about single cases um, in in a very detailed fashion. Yeah? But um, perhaps in an abstract fashion, I can tell you, um, we again experience that we have very different tools uh, to react um, as a supervisor. And here, um, apart, uh, coming back you know, to my, my, 
my request not only for good supervision, but a request for good um, uh, regulation. I think here some work still needs to be done by the European and the national lawmaker. Um, we do have very different standards um, uh, being applied to banks, for example, in large exposure rules, uh, um, because there are still very different national legislation um, around. We do have different tools as a supervisor. In some countries, we can use a moratorium in order to stop a liquidity drain on a bank. In other countries, we cannot use um, uh, this because we do not have a moratorium. So here, we still um, um, wait um, for a lot of work which has to happen on the harmonization in, in regulation. So there's a question in the, in the center here, please. And can I please ask you to just ask one question per questioner, because otherwise it's, we have a lot of questions here. Yes. Hi, good morning. Uh, Nicolas Menendez Harris from Expansion. Uh, last week, uh, the SRB published a more complete uh, non-confidential version of the popular evaluation report. Uh, according to the resolution authority, uh, it was the ECB who asked not, not, to, not to disclose uh, some points about ELA uh, and liquidity outflows. Um, do you agree with that uh, statement? And uh, why did you decide not to publish uh, all the information? Thank you. Many thanks for the question. I, th I think I will answer. We do have a very strict confidentiality obligation given um, uh, to us by the uh, lawmaker. We are allowed to know everything with regard to a bank. This is the one side. And in order to balance this broad information um, um, uh, possibility, um, the lawmaker gave us a confidentiality obligation to meaning that we are not allowed uh, to publish something uh, on a specific bank if we do not have the consent. Yeah? Uh, this is the information I'm talking about with regard to the supervisory process. Coming to the ELA process, let me remind you, and here again, I'm not um, allowed to give you, um, you know, individual comments, but let, you, let me remind you that ELA is a national task. Um, ELA is given by the National Central Bank, and if ELA uh, moves beyond a certain threshold, then the, center, the ECB, the Governing Council, is asked whether there is any objection to this, objections which have to be based on monetary policy grounds. Yeah? Um, this decision is a case-by-case -case decision, this kind of objection or non-objection. And here, um, uh, the, the, the first question I would ask, um, I would relate to uh, the National Central Bank, because there is the source um, of a decision. And the second one is then a very, very bank-specific uh, discussion, uh, which we do not comment on. Next question here, the gentleman in the middle here. Then I'll come back. Um. Deutsche um, Welle. There were some reports in Greek media that the trigger of uh, recapitalization will be 6 to 6.5 percent under the adverse scenario. Could you con uh, confirm that? And my second question, why don't you use the upcoming stress test for another capital increase so that the Greek banks can clean up their balance sheets from their huge MPL pile once and for all. Thank you. Well, as you have two questions, uh, I will start with the first and let uh, Sabine uh, response, respond for, to the second part. Uh, the, it's not a pass-fail uh, stress test exercise. Uh, which means that uh, there is no particular uh, trigger. Uh, and uh, the possible recapitalization, the need for a possible recapitalization for all the banks, the Greek banks, just like the other uh, banks in the EBA stress test, will be uh, decided on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis by the, the supervisory board. So that's the, the situation, uh, nothing else. Uh, so no need to discuss uh, percentages that may be uh, irrelevant, f relevant for one bank and not for the others, and uh, which do not make sense uh, to be implemented for both baseline and uh, adverse uh, may be for certain banks. Case by case basis, uh, supervisory board decision. 
And perhaps may I add, just to give you an idea why it is a case-by-case -case, uh, decision. The EBA methodology is a methodology which will be applied to about 50 banks, if I remember correctly. Yeah. It will be about 37, 38 um, uh, SSM banks. It has to be um, a, a size-fits-all methodology. Yeah? The outcome yeah, and the question of what do you have to adjust in order to take into account very bank-specific um, uh, facts yeah, like restructuring, uh, like um, already um, agreed upon um, contracts to sell this or that, yeah, but which were not being able to take, uh, which were not taken into account until the end of last year. Yeah, this kind of facts we have to take into account when deciding whether a bank. Um, needs more capital or not. And that cannot be taken into account in an EBA um, um, fit one size fits all uh, process. So it is very relevant that you take this kind of case by case decision before you move into a very bank specific individual decision as a supervisor. Otherwise, we would set rules, you know, which we do not do. We have um, bank specific um, uh, measures. Now the second uh, question. Um, uh, let me let me be very abstract because um, uh, we have not yet started the stress test, and you are already asking me about the results and the consequences of uh, the results. Um, um, I, I don't have a. I think you call it in English a crystal ball, yeah. So I do not know uh, the outcome um, yet. But uh, what we for sure need to do is to ensure equal treatment. Uh, for all the banks which might need additional capital. Yeah? And that means um, that um, we have to look into the bank-specific risk profile, and then we have to see what kind of requirements do we set um, for um, the SREP, um, for the capital add-ons, and then we will see what will happen. So let's take the gentleman over here, and then we'll come back to you. Thank you. Bernardo de Miguel from Cinco Dias. A question for Madame Nui. You said that the addendum on MPL will be uh, will be a new date on a new date for entering into force in the, uh, the uh, addendum. Mm -hmm. um, I, can, does it mean that it's going to be delayed? And what is the new date? Thank you. Well, it has already been delayed because it was uh, said in the consultation paper that it will be implemented by 1st January. <laughs> So uh, it is delayed, and uh, as soon as uh, it is uh, published, uh, you can expect that it will be implementable, but it's a decision to, to be taken by the, the supervisory board. I know that uh, the date of uh, first April is a possibility, but not, uh, not yet uh, decided. So it has already been delayed. Huh? It's not a piece of news. It was supposed to be uh, 1st January. OK, let's continue. Let's go um, in the front row here, please. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, just just to return to, to, to Nicholas's point about there being national interest, some people would see this delay on the um, the addendum of how to treat new NPLs as a classic example of those national interests superseding those of the, the region as a whole. Um, I mean, what would you say to that? And at the time when the addendum was originally discussed, there seemed to be some hints that there were going to be tougher measures taken on the stock. Has that now been shelved, or is that still something that you'll look at once this delay is overcome? Thank you. Well, I will not uh, call, uh, well, national interest, but normal human uh, beings' reactions that uh, uh, countries or banks that can be hurt by a measure are uh, uh, the more uh, vocal about uh, possible consequences. I think, uh, well, it's almost normal uh, as far as I am concerned. Uh, so uh, we, uh, we are able, with all these explanations, to do the, the, the good thing, including, uh, in particular, uh, explain that uh, the addendum is uh, not uh, binding instruments, that uh, it is the starting point of the supervisory dialogue, that it will be implemented on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. I think this is useful uh, clarification. 
As far as the, the stock is concerned, this is a work in progress. There, is, there was not even a first meeting of the supervisory board uh, on the issue, so let's wait what will be, uh, what will be uh, decided. Uh, the, the two documents are at different stages. On the one side, we have the addendum that is uh, very advanced in its finalization and for which uh, uh, the, the publication can be expected by mid-March. Uh, we coordinate this with the, the, the European Commission that is also going public by the, the, the same time. Uh, for the, the stock, uh, that's the, uh, still to be discussed and decided by the supervisory board. I have a few more questions here in the middle. Take the, the lady in the, in, the, yeah, in the middle there. Yeah, please. Um, Barbara Schneider, Stuttgarter Zeitung, thank you. Also on NPL, you said yourself the stock is still high and there's no decision on how to deal with it yet. Uh, so how then can you convince countries with a relatively low stock that time is ripe for EDIS, as you say? Well, just to change the tone of the response, uh, even if the content is the same on the stock, Sabine, well, please, no, could you no say? Problem, no problem, no problem, Watson. So, um, first of all, let me uh, tell you very c uh, clearly, we are doing a lot of work on the stock. It's not that we are um, lenient uh, there, on the contrary, and I think we can uh, take a little bit of the praise when uh, looking into the reduction of the stock, um, the last three years, 200 billion, um, that part of it yeah, um, is the result of our constant pressure and our constant request um, for working um, um, on the stock. And I like to use the uh, chance uh, perhaps to add something sure. um, to a former uh, question. Uh, we are not uh, pressuring banks um, to sell um, uh, NPLs. Um, there are all kinds of different tools how you can reduce um, um, the legacy um, uh, issue you have. It's not only about uh, loading them off, you know, to, to a third party. And this is sometimes a little bit, um, yeah, how can I say this, forgotten, yeah, because everybody only talks about the sale. It is very, very important to have a good workout um, in a bank. Uh, you can earn quite a lot of money um, by uh, having good strategies there, competent people, highly qualified uh, people, I can, I can tell you. Um, and um, um, very, very essential is, too, that the governments, um, that the countries um, ensure that they have a legal and judicial environment where you can have a quick workout. Because the quicker the workout is, the higher the value of the NPL, yeah? uh, the better um, the banks can draw upon collateral um, and uh, have uh, recovery rates which are uh, relevant um, uh, for their um, capital, for their provisioning uh, level too. Huh? Um, so uh, just to give you um, this kind of, yeah, um, um, working on the NPL, to come to your EDIS question, yeah, working on the NPL is one of the major tasks with regard to supervision um, when talking about risk reduction. You know, when, when uh, you hear discussion about EDIS, uh, it is always um, a discussion between um, risk reduction and risk sharing, um, which have to be um, balanced and have to be um, uh, looked at at the same time. Um, a banking supervisor is part and is supposed to be part of the risk reduction. NPL is one big issue, yeah? uh, but there are other issues too. It's not only NPL. Yeah? Um, I know that this is the most sexiest thing right now for you uh, <laughs> in the questions, and I hear this, but let us not forget um, that we have many, many banks in the euro area which do not have to do a lot of work with regard to an NPL stock, but which might uh, need to do work on their business model, on their profitability, on their risk management, on cyber uh, risk. Um, so this is part of our work too. And with our priorities, I think we make a very good, you know, kind of grab on all kinds of issues. 
Thank you. Um, I think we had a question uh, here in this um, fourth row. Frediano Finucci, TG La Sette, Italy. We were talking about uh, risk and NPLs. What do you say to those critics who um, accuse the supervision to focus too much on NPLs and not to take into sufficient account uh, uh, derivatives, for example? Well, we, all, we look at all risk. We assess all risk, and we try to get mitigants of all risk. And the comparison which is made quite often uh, with this uh, level three or level two uh, asset. Let me say that uh, we are conducting uh, rigorous reviews of valuation and pricing models for market risk. Uh, we investigate market risk aspects both uh, in uh, internal models, in uh, off-site supervision, in on-site supervision with, uh, with missions. Those risks are taken into account in the SREP uh, methodology. Uh, uh, we have also horizontal benchmarks that are used for this uh, kind of risk. Also, it is part of the capital surcharge for global CFEs. It ev it's even part in two uh, boxes, uh, two elements, two criteria of the global CFEs methodology. One is the complexity element, on one is the resolvability element. Uh, so it is covered in my view, uh, and we will certainly not stop covering it, uh, because those are uh, important uh, elements and important risk. We think that we are looking uh, across all risk uh, for all banks. So in a nutshell, it's a fairy tale that we are not looking at derivatives. Thank you for saying simply. Sorry. Many thanks. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we have plenty of figures regarding the uh, derivative business of all the banks that are in this uh, in this business. Yes, of course. But you know, it's a fairy tale too um, that all derivatives are very risky. They are very plain vanilla derivatives, um, which are more or less alone. And then there are very complex ones uh, where you re really need to look at it in detail. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and the banks which are doing um, a business in this uh, perspective, we are monitoring and we are assessing, examining on-site and off-site thoroughly. So who has a question? The lady here in the middle, please. Vasan Gelet from Insider Greece. I would like to ask you whether you are satisfied with the reduction of NPLs in Greece, especially through the auctions procedure, which seems to be lagging. And my second question, uh, should the prices of collaterals sold through auctions are considerably and consistently lower than the value recorded in the books of the banks? Would you ask Greek banks to take provisions? Thank you. Uh, are we satisfied uh, with the efforts <coughs> made by uh, Greek banks? Well, we are indeed satisfied that uh, the, the movement has started and that good efforts are, are made and that uh, they start uh, bringing uh, fruits. Uh, it's, but this is not uh, the end of the task and a lot uh, still uh, has to, to, to be done. Uh, regarding uh, electronic auction, that uh, is true that uh, it has been uh, well delayed uh, for, for, for some times. But uh, I am told, and uh, I believe that is correct, that uh, it has already, even before it is used, produced some effects. Because uh, you have one category of uh, defaulters, <coughs> unpaid uh, loans, uh, which are what we call in our jargon uh, strategic defaulters. Uh, strategic defaulters uh, don't want to discover one day that their property is on sale uh, in an uh, electronic uh, auction. So they can pay, they should have paid, and they, they, will be, uh, they are ready now to pay uh, in uh, more uh, normal uh, conditions. So sometimes start the momentum is already delivering uh, some good uh, developments. Well, uh, whether the, the, the prices uh, are too low compared to uh, uh, current uh, provisions, obviously, if the solution picked up uh, is sale, 
indeed, we look at to, to see whether the plan is uh, credible. Uh, we look at the level of provision and the level of uh, solvency. Uh, you have to, when you are uh, selling and uh, uh, to be credible, uh, you have to be able to, to take the loss. But as Sabine has said uh, very rightfully so, in my view, is that sale is only one of the elements. She quoted a number of other possible uh, solutions. I, I would even add one more, which is restructuring the loans early enough in the life of the loan to make them performing. At this moment, maybe the banks has to give up something, some interest, some, but uh, it's uh, really uh, little compared to what uh, happens when you uh, are not addressing the issue at the beginning. And I would also take this opportunity to say something that has not been said yes, uh, uh, yet regarding non-performing exposures. Non-performing exposures uh, are a problem that goes, uh, is a problem that uh, goes much beyond uh, supervisory action. And there is uh, something which is very important, which is the efficiency of the uh, legal proceedings, the efficiency of the legal uh, framework. And this is a very important element for the price of the NPLs. If there is uh, certainty on the length of the legal proceedings, if there is uh, an efficient uh, legal framework for repossessing uh, collateral, then the price of the NPLs can go up uh, in significant uh, proportion. And that's why a number of countries, uh, almost all the countries that are burdened, all the countries even that are burdened with NPLs, have taken uh, action to change the, the legal framework and make it working better. And all those initiatives are going in the same direction, making banks safer and sounder in this respect. But we have to keep on track now. Yeah? Yes, of you course. Know? So doing it one year is not sufficient. Yeah, we we have to move forward and make progress. Yeah. So we have time for a few more questions. Let's let lady in the front here, please. Uh, Patricia Kalsman of the Wall Street Journal. Um, you know, given the Basel III is being sort of sorted and amid the continued pressure on profitability. Uh, is it your expectation or in hope that uh, 2018 is going to be a year we're going to start seeing some cross-border um, consolidation in the banking system? And based on your conversations with banks, have you you getting an impression that that's you know something that can possibly happen this year, beginning this year? Thank you. Well, I can start on this one by saying that uh, a number of European banks are not earning the cost of their capital. So obviously, uh, something will have uh, to happen. And one of the solutions for that uh, is consolidation of the, the, the banking sector. Uh, I hope that uh, the, this will uh, happen sooner uh, than, than later. Will it be immediately uh, cross-border is to be seen. Sometimes there are also uh, uh, national uh, synergy mergers that are uh, making a lot of sense, and we have seen uh, a few uh, of them uh, uh, already, like uh, Populare Milano and uh, Populare. So I think uh, this, uh, this, will, uh, this will go on. Uh, personally, as a supervisor, I think uh, we have, uh, and this is something we will, uh, I will express and we will express uh, to the legislators, we have to be uh, more open-minded regarding, in my view, uh, waivers, uh, cross-border waivers for liquidity uh, on capital uh, within the banking union because uh, I think uh, we should be considered, we are a single uh, jurisdiction, so we, uh, all the information uh, regarding the SSM Bank is uh, on the table to all the members so they can uh, uh, be actors in the, in the supervision. So I, I hope that uh, that will uh, develop. Uh, I have seen uh, recently a letter from uh, a number of uh, big banks uh, within the SSM asking the legislators to uh, be uh, more open-minded regarding these uh, cross-border waivers. And I must say I agree with what they are requesting. But maybe, Sabine, you want to no, say no, something? No, no, nothing, nothing to add. So I think we have time for maybe two more questions. Here in the middle? Here in the, no, sorry, here in the center, yeah. I think the gentleman had raising his hand the whole time. Roberto, 
Roberto Ozzi of the Italian Press Agency has can you, you have said that you are coordinating with the European Commission on the NPL issue and the addendum. I would like to ask what about the European Parliament and the European Council because of the fact that the legal services of both the institutions have said that the SSM has gone beyond its mandate with this addendum. So uh, will the final version of the addendum will give an answer to their complaints or will it be simply a statement that you act within your mandate? And if it's possible, just a question on the stock market. We have just seen an abrupt uh, volatility episode. Uh, with the information you have available now, do you feel confident that the European banks would be able to cope with the uh, a correction similar to the one that is uh, foreseen in the new stress test. Thank you. Regarding the European Parliament that you uh, mentioned, uh, I have uh, regular uh, hearings with the Econ Committee, and I am uh, very glad to have this opportunity to uh, listen to what uh, the members of the parliament have to tell to me and uh, to respond to concerns or explain what, uh, what we are doing. So the next one will be uh, in March uh, at the occasion of the issuance of the annual report. Uh, regarding the, the legal concerns that were es expressed, well, I can tell you we have put the best legal brains uh, of the SSM on NCB to make sure it's absolutely clear uh, that uh, it's uh, not binding, it's part of the supervisory dialogue, it's case by case. Uh, um, I, we can even put bigger letters, uh, red. <laughs> well, I, I think all the conditions are met. Uh, let's see uh, whether it is clear. May I add something? Sure. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, I think we had a misunderstanding um, here. Um, and I think we, we explained very clearly where our legal basis is, why we are doing what we are doing. Um, there are in the CRR and the CRD4 very clear paragraphs which say that we have to assess um, not only c the credit risk methodology, but the provisioning methodology uh, too. And the EU Commission uh, confirmed that um, with this assessment that we can um, um, that, that this assessment can result um, in uh, deductions, in measures of the supervisor out of prudential perspectives, beyond the accounting perspectives, if we uh, think that there are additional risks which need to be covered out, out of a prudential perspective. So there is a very clear obligation of um, the SSM to look into the provisioning methodology. And as we are asked by the European Parliament, by the European Court of Auditors, and by many others um, uh, to explain what is the basis of our assessment, we publish yeah, the exactly. addendum. <laughs> yeah? This is the basis, the starting point. And on this basis, yeah, we discuss with the, with the banks whether um, their risks are different from our um, starting point from our basis, and then we decide case by case. So no automatism, no binding thing, but rather fulfilling and complying with the request of the European Parliament and the European Court of Auditors to be transparent in our assessment methodology uh, used for fulfilling our obligation uh, according to the CRR and the CRD4. So one last question to the lady in the back, please. Um, hello. Uh, I would like to know this. Uh, it is proposal or the uh, the the AQR is this a proposal of the SSM, the ECB, or just an idea or a decision? And until when, with Brexit, if we have a hard Brexit, um, the banks have to decide if uh, the clearing business um, is um, uh, has to be shifted to the. Uh, to other places than London, uh, end of the year or March or what? Well, regarding uh, EDIS on this possible uh, AQR, and I will let Sabine respond on Brexit, 
Uh, it's uh, in a document published uh, by the European authorities, the Council, if I remember well, uh, that mentioned the possibility of having an AQR, yes. It's not a request from us, or uh, we have nothing to do with it. We just found it uh, in the uh, European documents, European authorities' document. With regard to Brexit? Uh, Which was published, the document, uh, not... Uh, Sorry, uh, no, 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 no problem. With regard to Brexit, Mrs. Osman, I did not understand the question fully. I'm sorry. If there's uh, if there's um, no uh, political decision on on clearing and how to supervise it and so on, um, uh, until when banks um, uh, have to decide if they shift it to the EU because maybe it's not further um, uh, allowed to 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 be in London. Well, I mean, uh, let us uh, let us wait. You know, on the negotiation, there is still uh, more than one year left, um, and we will see uh, what kind of framework we will have around it. And with the next press conference, we can come back to your <laughs> question. Okay, I, I don't have a crystal ball. You know, with regard to the negotiations, I, am, I, I thought maybe it's end of Q two or something because you were very. No, no. I'm talking. License. I'm talking about con continuity arrangements. Yeah, uh, meaning um, um, to have a plan, um, uh, to have um, l to have looked into what kind of possibilities, uh, what kind of alternatives do I have, and what kind of process do I have um, uh, to uh, to look at, yeah, and and to fulfill in order to come to a certain degree. Sorry, result. The answer to the stock market question is that um, we do not comment uh, on single uh, fluctuations of the stock market. And as a central banker, as well as a supervisor, I can tell you, you anyway, I mean, if not the first, would uh, yeah, uh, give a, the second uh, would be our principle that first um, you have to look into the facts um, and uh, the reasons, et cetera, before you say anything to the public. Uh, as a supervisor and a central bank. But don't forget the first principle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much all for coming. We'll close the press conference here. <laughs>